Hi, my name is Meta. Um, I'm the founder of MyMe. It's a digital therapeutics company where we identify triggers in order to reverse disease symptoms for autoimmune patients. Um, the company started out um, with me as the end of one. I was the one who had the problematic journey um, that ended me up in, in this place of patient. Um, I was 14 when I got my first autoimmune condition, psoriasis, and I noticed like three dots on my neck and then the next day I just had it all over. And the shock in it of itself was pretty uh, disturbing to a, a young girl. We immediately got like a famous acupuncturist in Denmark to kind of give me whatever supplementation and they brought me to, you know, a different climate and it pretty much got reversed relatively fast. Um, but for me, my, my teenage years was more around not being able to do what others were able to do, but without knowing why. So in Denmark, teenagers drink and I was unable to do so. I literally had my parents begging me not to because if I had a drink on Saturday night, I would be out of school at least Tuesday, but most likely Tuesday, Wednesday. And now I know it's, you know, a mutation on my liver, but at the time I had no idea. Like, I remember when I was a teenager, actually, probably 18, 19, and I started gaining weight rapidly. Um, and the agency I was working for, when you have a set card, you know, there's no weight gain um, in the parameters of what's okay. And they assigned me a boxing trainer and a nutritionist. And the nutritionist basically had me on an 1800 calorie diet that then became 1500, 1200. I remember when she fired me for cheating because nobody in her opinion could be gaining weight at 1200 calorie diet. My question wasn't whether she was right. My only thing was there's something wrong with me. And then around age of 20, I started feeling very different. So for me, I started going to the doctors. I started basically trying to figure out why was I not feeling right. Blood work was always fine. And then at 23, after having exhausted the, the Danish uh, healthcare system, I moved to LA. And moving to LA was quite detrimental to my health in some ways, and in other ways kind of perfect. Temperature-wise and weather-wise, made me, you know, not have to worry about psoriasis or any of those things. But on the flip side, I started losing my eyesight. I would be going into the kitchen to fetch something and I could see the kitchen clearly. But as I would get close to the kitchen table, I, it all would gray out. Like I couldn't see what was there. And the first time it, it happened, I remember thinking I'm having like a, a brain seizure or something, like th this is not right. And they took one look at me and my eyes were out and my throat was big and they were like, mm, we know exactly what this is. And they medicated me and I was like relieved. And then the next morning they came back with like seven residents and like your blood work came back perfect. This is, you know, this is an interesting case. But once it's happened a few times, it's not so interesting anymore for them or for me. I would get these um, heart cramps and I would faint. And it got to the point where, you know, like you're going upstairs and you faint and you fall and you hurt yourself and, and you manage, like you find ways around it. And I think that's one of the things that I always think about with chronic ill people is that we, we kind of come across as okay because we find ways around it. I remember after I moved back to Denmark in 2003, I believe, and, um, got a job at a fashion company and we had like this huge staircase going up to the first floor. I couldn't walk to the first floor without ponting like a 75 year old man. So you figure out a way that like about a third up, you introduce them to the shoe department and then, you know, another third up, you introduce them to something else so that you actually can make it up the staircase with the clients. And those years I would have literally killed for sugar or carbs around four o'clock. Like my blood sugar was so unstable. It was like all sorts of things that were kind of off. I ended up seeing a psychiatrist because I was hoping I was a hypochondriac. Like, but I think you're just looking for any kind of explanation. And then when I, when I became quote unquote, like a cardiac patient, I started taking blood thinners, cholesterol lowers, like 
but not all at once. Like it started out blood thinners and then the next thing. And it was like when you woke up in the morning, you didn't know what you would be waking up to. That was the worst part. It was like the not having any control. I'm a little bit OCD on some levels. I actually f flew to see this guy who was a specialist in like stomach related issues, I guess. I don't even know if I knew any closer than that. And then I got there and I had to sign a release form that he was a veterinarian. And I remember calling my mom and I'm like, he's a vet. And my mom was like, get out of there. And much to my own surprise, he was actually the first one to kind of like, at least figure out why I wasn't feeling great. Um, but more so than anything, he looked at all the paperwork. You fill out like 10 pages of like, how do you feel? And he, he took one look at it and he sat me down and he said, you're really not feeling well. And to my memory, that was the first time anyone acknowledged that I didn't feel well. And I just started crying. And he made me drink sugar water. So like fasting blood sugar, sugar water, and then had me lie down on a, um, on a bed for like, I don't know how long. And then he asked me to sit up slowly and then get up standing slowly. And my resting pulse was 64. And my pulse, once I had gotten from lying to standing, was 141. And he was basically like, if I ran a marathon, my pulse would go to where your pulse is from just getting up from lying to standing. So he was like, if you were anywhere close to where you lived, I would literally have gotten you to the hospital. But um, it ended up being that it was insulin resistance. I could now actually go and get an endocrinologist and get like all the different specialists. And I remember I went to this specialist on Park Avenue and, um, and it was fascinating because it was like he knew me better than I knew me. He was like, you don't eat fruit. And I was like, no, he's like, it doesn't do anything for you. And, but, it, but it was like in such detail because of course he'd seen thousands of me. I only had me to go by and none of what I had been taught kind of applied to my own scenarios. So my, my latter half of my twenties pretty much was like collecting disease labels and drugs like candy. I um, got psoriatic arthritis with that came Humira. Like I actually had a period where I didn't go to the doctors because I felt like if I go, I'll get another drug, I'll get another diagnosis. Like it, it's just kind of felt like never ending. So, you know, I was now going into my 30s, a chronic patient with six autoimmune conditions, um, Sjogren's, uh, metabolic eggs, like basically like the, the slew of things that, that people get. Like I think the one thing that we don't think about is when the, if you think of the body as different processes, once those processes are off, they're going to have implications on everything. And um, for me, what that ended up being was some sort of control, like I kept all of my doctors. So I always asked the questions, is there anything I can do? Should I be changing my diet? Like, should I be? And I always got the answer that no. Like I remember my endocrinologist telling me that I was genetically in a position where even if I did all of the things that I would read about in the magazines, it would come back like a boomerang. And he told me these stories about women who had thought they could eat their way out of insulin resistance, but um, you know, then a year later he would see them and now they'd be full-blown diabetics. So for me that was like, okay, when he told me like, this is your friend for life, I was like, this is my friend. So I didn't actually question much. And, and in hindsight, I'm kind of puzzled that I didn't question it more. But I think I was just kind of happy that there was answers. About 10 years after being diagnosed, mid-30s now, and I get, get a call that my doctor's team have great news and get supercharged and go in. And then upon arriving at the hospital, get told that, still silly, that I wasn't gonna die in the immediate future. And there was several aha moments in that. First, it had never actually dawned on me how dire my situation was until that moment. Secondly, I was naively optimistic, so I actually at first asked, okay, that's great, um, so what's the, what's the good news? 
at which point it got exceedingly awkward because this was the great news. At the time, actually, the one thing that came to my head was, I'm a CEO for a company. If I went to my board of advisors and told them we're not going to go bankrupt in the immediate future, I don't have a job. So I, I posed the question, what are we going to do about my process? To which the answer was, we're happy with your numbers. He could have said 20 things that would have me come back. But numbers, like I'm an economist by training, I'm autistic with numbers, it's kind of where I feel safe. And by him saying, oh, we're happy with this, I kind of saw eight years VKG data in my head and was like, mm -mm, this is not, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. But more so, he can't help me. I should be so thankful for this doctor because at that moment, yes, I was disempowered as a patient, but I was empowered as a human being in the sense that if I wasn't going to do something, I was going to die. And from that moment on, so it was very much like writing down things in a journal and then transcribing them into an Excel spreadsheet because that's where us economics feel like we're at home. But the good thing about tracking things is that you start paying attention. So I started seeing patterns of things that shouldn't be. Like I would go out to see my uncle in, in uh, Phoenix and he's a roper and they basically wake up and have three eggs and a steak. And I would be you know, on his diet for three days while we were like in the back country. And I would come home and my, my, my junk numbers look good. If I looked up with the American Heart Association and said I should be eating, that was not the diet that I should be eating. So I basically started kind of A-B testing um, my system. And, and I think from that, I got enough insight that, you know, five months in, you know, all of a sudden I could drop my blood thinners, my cholesterol lowers. And I was like, wow, like every time I got a new autoimmune condition, or at least the label, I would be told that it was because of my cardiac issues or it was because of something else. And as I was kind of like unraveling this, I was like, I should probably be able to get rid of all of it. It took me 16 months to normalize my blood work, get off my drugs, and I'm, you know, seven years drug and symptom free today. So um, all of a sudden, my doctor's team was like, well, maybe you didn't have those diseases in the first place. And, you know, sometimes the body can be interesting. And I was like, fine, take them off my, my you know, EMR, whatever we call it. And they were like, well, well it's not that easy. I'm like, it's either or especially because at the time there was a lot of talk about like insurance and how much they were going to have access to and I was literally afraid that I was never going to be able to be insured here. And, um, and then they started, you know, pulling out my blood work and my stats and all that and they're like, no, that's not possible. And I was like, so either I had these diseases and I reversed them or I didn't have them. But essentially one of the things that baffled me when I came out on the other side, so to speak, was that I had friends, not like distant friends, like relatively close friends that would say to me, oh, I didn't even know you were sick. Like, were you, were you really sick? It was just a big aha moment for me to realize that people had not even really understood my situation. And I think it's a very common thing is you don't want to be defined by it. And you, you almost don't want to even acknowledge that it's a part of you. So you just find ways of dealing with it so that nobody really understands or sees at least the situation that you're in.